Oh, wait, you're listening. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. <coughs> you're listening, listening to Radio Lab. Look it! Radio Lab. From WNYC. See? Yeah. <laughs> Hey there, Lulu here. It is the end of the summer, and here in North America, we are just beginning to leave behind arguably the loudest season for animal noises, just mosquitoes buzzing and crickets chirping and birds singing. And and today we have a story that is about that wall of noise that you can encounter when you walk into a grassland or a forest or a jungle. Only, we have a story about two very clever humans who began to decode that wall of noise down into actual language. They began to understand and decipher the words, so to speak, that the animals were saying. And that allowed them to eavesdrop and learn the sort of surprising things that animals are actually talking about. Yes, this is all real science. This is all real stuff. It's a very fun story. Um, And I'm going to just kick it off, hand it over to Radiolab hosts, Jad Abumrad and Robert Krolwich. Here we go. So we're going to tell you two tales here. Two different places. The first, a jungle. And the second? A prairie. Right. Jungle gets us started. And then the prairie later. Uh, this is a story, this first one, that we heard about. Yeah, yeah. I'm, from Ari. I'm Ari Daniel Shapiro. I'm a public radio producer in Boston. And Ari recently met a guy. I think a German guy. He's, uh, he's Swiss. No. Oh, okay. So yeah, Sorry. his name's Klaus Zuberbuhler. Hey, Ari, it's Klaus. And he's a professor of psychology. At the University of St. Andrews. Which is in Scotland. And where does the story actually take place? Because Where's the jungle? Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I, maybe the best place to start is to kind of describe the, the scene where we are. Okay. Which is in the Thai forest. Thai forest. Which is in the Ivory Coast in Africa. So it's not in Thailand. No, it's not. No. It's T-A-I. T-A-I. Okay. Yeah. And... Klaus describes the jungle as this thick sensory world. Very dark, very moist, and very, very green. And you can't really see for more than 15 to 20 feet. And, I mean, sometimes you feel like you you walk through, uh, you know, a, a big cathedral of dark trees, and you don't see very much because all the animals are obviously very shy and run away. I mean, is it still? <laughs> Uh, no, it's it is it is very very noisy. It's a din. It's just this kind of sonic chaos. chaos. All these insects and birds and bats and mammals. It, it's almost as if they compete for acoustic space. So it is very very loud. I mean, the the, the main sensation you have in the beginning really is that you're you're just completely lost. So, it's 1991, and he figured he had to start somewhere, so he focused his attention on a kind of monkey. A very beautiful monkey, I think. Called the Diana monkey. It's a mix of black, white, and sort of reddish. Diana monkeys live up in the treetops, which can be as high as 100 feet off the ground. Wow. They eat fruits, and they eat insects, and they're chattering. A cacophony of calls. Which, to him, of course, you know, as, an, as a newcomer to the forest, was all just noise. So it's a little bit, I imagine, like a, a child trying to learn a language, which initially must just sound like a, a string of sounds that he can't really understand. And then, you know, what? So what did he do? Well, he started provoking the monkeys into making different kinds of noises. For instance, he'd walk out into the forest with a boombox a speaker and play. <laughs> the sound of the Diana monkey's most feared predator, the leopard. He would just play the sound into the trees? Yep. Well, and all of a sudden, suddenly, they start leaping around the branches, you know, you see all hopping around, motion, and, and they make this one particular call. You know, these very loud alarm calls. This one here. Meaning what? Yeah, are they just saying, like, run? 
or is it something more specific? Well, here's where it gets a little bit more interesting. Next step, he brought that same cassette player out. Pointed at the trees, hit play, all that? Yep, but this time he plays... The shrieks of a crowned eagle. Eagles eat monkeys? Yeah, they do. They attack from above. I've heard about them. They're very scary. They come flying in with their talons or their beaks, and they hit you in the head sharply and kill you instantly. Oof. And then you fall to the ground. Yeah. And so what do the monkeys do when they hear this? They make... (laughs) That sound. Same one? Well, that's what he thought. But when he went back to the lab and started looking at the sounds on the computer, comparing one to the other, eagle... Leopard. Eagle. Leopard. He realized that they're actually slightly different. In the acoustic details of the calls. And it's something that is very difficult to hear when you're... You really only see it in in the spectrogram, which is kind of a visual representation of these calls. This is on the computer? Yeah. But interestingly, once you've seen that, and once you know what to pay attention to, you go out into the forest and, and suddenly you do hear these differences, which you haven't heard before. So you're saying when they hear a call leopard coming, they go up the tree, but when they hear eagle coming, they run down the tree? Exactly. Exactly. So it's really kind of like a word. They, it's yep. like a word. Well, that's kind of amazing. Let's pull out for a second, because this guy actually got us thinking, honestly. How much language actually is out there in the wild? Like, what do we know? What's the state of what we know right now? And that question led us out of the forest, just for a second, and to a place and a creature we just didn't think would be a part of this conversation at all. Um, and that creature is... The prairie dog. Woo! Prairie dogs. So here's the thing. Prairie dogs are these little rodent-like animals. They live under the ground in burrows. And when their community is invaded, they, you know, pop out of the burrow. And they say, oh here comes the whatever. Sounds kind of like chee, 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 chee. <laughs> chee, 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 chee. So we spoke with this guy. Uh, my name is Khan Slobachikov, professor emeritus at Northern Arizona University. Who's spent a whole lot of time sitting out in the colonies. Recording prairie dog calls. And he now believes that these simple little rodents are like nature's wordsmiths. Well, the thing is that initially I recorded... For instance, he began by telling us that the prairie dogs have different kinds of cheese. For different kinds of predators. For example... Humans, coyotes, and dogs. Right. Is this the kind of thing that we would actually be able to hear the difference between the calls? I'm guessing that you could hear the difference. You want to try it, Chad? Yeah. So, can you just play those samples? All right, so here's one. This is another one. All right. Here you go. This is a third. Those represent different predators? Yep. (laughs) I, I I, I can't tell the difference. Can you? I mean, do you know what they are? My guess is human, dog, coyote. Con was right. Con was right? Wow. Well, naturally, we wondered how how did he... How did he he do that? Yeah. He told us that at first, just like you and I, he couldn't figure out how to distinguish between these sounds, but he took the sound back to the lab. Where we had a machine that allowed us to measure a series of uh, frequency and time elements in the call. And what this computer does is it takes the sound that the prairie dogs make and it essentially looks inside for the ingredients inside the sound. Yeah, like, uh, well, it's kind of hard to hear with a chirp. Because it's just hard. So l- let me uh, demonstrate crudely with this other sound. I plucked this at random from my library. So this is kind of like a buzz. Okay. Okay. Mm. Let me just loop it so we can hear it better. So here you've got this buzz, which is sounds to us like a solid piece of noise. But get an EQ and take away all the highs. So now you've got just the bass. Yep. Now, you'll notice that if you add the highs back in real slowly, these little hidden overtones will pop out. Like, uh, there's one. Yep. There's another. Uh huh. Third. <laughs> yep. Fourth. Uh huh. So, in other words, this sound is filled with little ghost notes that we can't hear. And certainly the same is true of this sound. Except in the case of the prairie dogs, it seems their ears are tuned to hear all the different sounds within the chirp. 
probably sounds to them like this whole layer cake of tones. And Khan's computer noticed that the noise they made when a human walked through their village was different in tone from the noise they made when a coyote walked through their village. It was, it was consistently different. But there was a problem. When he zoomed in on the, uh-oh, here come the human calls. These ones here. And he looked at them really closely. He saw that from one human call to the next, there was a lot of subtle variation. Much, much more than I would expect. And that's when it hit him. What if? What if? What if? What if they could be describing the individual humans? Oh. Now, at that time, no one suspected that this might even be a possibility. But I thought, well, let's try it and see what happens. So, Khan recruited four humans. And he had them dress exactly the same. Same boots, same blue jeans, same sunglasses, everything the same except the color of their shirts. We had a person in a blue t-shirt person in a green t-shirt, person in a yellow shirt, person in a gray shirt. Then he asked each of them to walk through the prairie dog village. One by one. Prairie dogs made their chirps. And when we analyzed the results, there were significant differences. Like what kind? They essentially clustered around the colors. Does that mean you think you can hear them saying, here comes the human in blue? Right. Versus here comes the human in yellow? Right. Really? Oh, I was astounded. I was astounded. And he was like, well, wait a second. These humans, they're not just different in their shirt colors. They're, they're different in all kinds of ways. Some of the humans were taller. Some of the humans were shorter. So we went back, reanalyzed the chirps, looked a little more closely. And he realized. We could tease out. That the prairie dogs were also commenting about the uh, general size of the human. Essentially, they were saying, here comes the tall human in the blue versus here comes the short human in the yellow. Wow. And then he made another leap. And it was just... You know, since he was on a roll. um, Off the wall idea at that time. He went back into the prairie dog field and he built two large wooden boxes. Sitting on stilts. A good distance from each other. uh, 150 feet. And we strung wires between the two towers. His team then made cardboard cutouts of three different shapes. A circle, a square, and a triangle. And then they ran them out along the wire, kind of like laundry fluttering above you in the breeze. Each shape would emerge from (laughs) one of the tower blinds and fly... (laughs) <laughs> uh, something like about three feet over the prairie dog town. So literally you would just kind of go, <laughs> and out would come a triangle or a circle or a square? Correct. And what we found was that the prairie dogs could tell the triangle from the circle very easily, but they could not seem to tell the difference between a square and a circle. Huh. Why not? Well, my guess is that Triangles kind of look like cocks. Mm. Circles and squares kind of look like terrestrial predators. Nonetheless, what you've got here is a little rodent with a remarkably big vocabulary, including but probably not limited to short, fat, skinny, tall, blue, green, yellow, gray, coyote, human, hawk, triangle, and or square. Yay! Not bad. Is the next step that you're going to perform a scene from The Winter's Tale and see whether the (laughs) prairie dogs laugh at the right moments? What do you do next? Well, we just are scratching the surface of looking at this. For example, prairie dogs have a lot of calls which we call social chatters. One prairie dog will be feeding and suddenly lift up its head and go chitter, chatter, chitter, chitter. And another prairie dog somewhere across the colony will lift up its head and go chatter, chatter, chitter, chitter. But what does it mean? We have no way of getting at it. Mm-hmm. It could be just simply chatter, chitter, chitter. Or it could be, do you know where Sam was last night? <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back in a moment. All right, we're back. On with the story. Now, here's an interesting question. I mean, if a French couple were sitting next to me on the subway and they were saying, do you know where Sam was last night in French? If I don't speak French, I'm outside of that conversation. But a lot of people do speak French and they can listen to French people talking. The question's then raised, if you live in the forest and you speak chimp or you speak eagle or you speak snake, would you ever be able to overhear or learn something from a neighborly species? In other words, is there an equivalent 
of listening to the other person talking French in, in the wild? Hmm. Good question. And that brings us back to Klaus. You remember Klaus? Yeah, the, the monkey guy. Yeah, the monkey guy. Well, Klaus was wondering the same thing. And that's uh, R.E. Daniel Shapiro again, who introduced us to Klaus. So take those alarm calls, for instance. He wanted to know whether different species of monkeys could understand each other. Right, so... Um, and luckily for there's, Klaus, um, there's like at least 10 different there's, primate species living inside that Thai forest. So there's... Um, One, colobus monkeys. Two, spot-nosed monkeys. Three, chimpanzees. Four, galagos. Five, colobines. Six, putty-nosed monkeys. Seven, mangabe species. Eight, prosimians. Nine, Campbell's monkey. And then the Dianas, 10. Yeah, so it's a very, very rich primate fauna. So Klaus's question was, could Diana monkeys understand the alarm calls of another one of these monkeys, the Campbell's monkey? Oh, could they go across monkey lines, so to speak? Exactly. Hmm. So he used that same setup from before. The speaker thing where he plays the sound into the trees? Yeah, and he played the eagle and leopard alarm calls from the Campbell's monkeys to the Dianas to see if they'd react. And what we found there, to our great surprise, was that the Diana monkeys... They understand it. Really? Really? Yep. They take it very, very seriously and respond to it very strongly. So a Diana monkey hearing a Campbell's eagle alarm call will respond as though there were an eagle and will respond to the leopard alarm call as though there were a leopard, and vice versa. And it doesn't stop there. Klaus started playing the monkey calls to birds. Such as hornbills. Yellow casked hornbills. It, it turns out that... They understand it. The birds? Yeah, these hornbills... Are capable of discriminating these different monkey alarm calls. Wow. So it's a pretty substantial web of species basically eavesdropping on, on each other's calls in these forests. But Klaus himself, he was still on the outside of it all. It, it is that um, general sense of perhaps not really belonging there. But then... He told me about this one day. I was uh, working um, in the forest. He, he had gone out for the day, and he had gone out alone. And it was very far away from camp. And it was in the late afternoon, and he realized that he should probably be heading back to camp. Because I still had to walk for, uh, you know, something like 15, 20 kilometers to, back to camp. And he was walking past a, a kind of valley. And then I heard on the other side of the valley a monkey group giving leopard alarm calls, which huh. doesn't happen that often. It was the first time that he wasn't actively listening, but he heard these monkeys make this call and recognized it. It was absolutely striking. And he was actually quite excited by this. Because I was suddenly able to understand what the monkeys trying to say, so to speak. Those monkeys had picked up a leopard. Right beneath that sound, there the leopard would be. Right. But, you know, those monkeys were way across the valley. So I, I didn't really think that much and walked on, perhaps, you know, half, half a mile further down the road. And the next group of Diana monkeys, still across the valley, uh, started giving leopard alarm calls as well. And he kind of took notice of that. And then it happened a third time, a few minutes later. What became clear to me very rapidly is that a leopard was tracking him. Oh. Of course, I couldn't see it because it was, you know, dense forest, but I, I assumed that the, the, the leopard saw me. And Ooh. of course, that, you know, is, is just one of these moments where you're, uh, you know, you're totally alone, um, far, far away from camp. What does he do? He, he kept walking. It happened. A fourth group called leopard. Fifth group called leopard. And then... The group stopped calling. The only thing I could think of is to pick up, um, you know, a large branch. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. That's just terrifying. Klaus, would that stick have done anything for you? Uh, I, I doubt I really would have been able to do very much with a stick. But as he's standing there, stick in hand, he realizes he's just entered the forest. He's become... The 11th primate. The 11th primate. Because there are those 10 other species of primate, and now... Me. Suddenly, I, I shifted from being the objective observer to being, uh, you know, sort of part of, of that whole crowd in there. Even though, you know, we're separated by 20, 30 millions of years of evolutionary history, you know, these humble creatures um, 
you know, were able to teach me something about uh, you know, what was going on in the forest. And I mean, of course, it wasn't intentional. They weren't trying to inform me or anything like that. Uh, but um, it, it was a, a very emotional experience. So what happened? I mean, obviously he didn't get eaten. What happened? Well, he, he made it back to camp, and he's not sure what happened to the leopard. The leopard must have slinked off into the forest. In the end, it became... Just another story to tell each other in the evening, I suppose. Yeah. 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 And that's it. Thanks so much for this story to Ari Daniel Shapiro. Thanks so much to you for listening to the noise and the words. And I am now so very excited to let you know that the next story we will be dropping is a brand new Terrestrials. Terrestrials, if you haven't listened, is our show about the strangeness right here on Earth, hosted by me, specially made to be family friendly. Every episode has an incredible, almost fantastical sounding story about an animal or plant or earthly phenomenon, Uh, but it's entirely true. We add lots of music. We even add original songs. It's kind of like Radiolab plus a musical, School of Rock, science style. I don't know. Uh, Come check it out. See if it's for you. That's starting in just two weeks, a whole new season of Terrestrials episodes headed your way. Uh, Thanks so much for listening. Enjoy the tail end of summer. See you in a couple spins of this noisy old planet of ours. Bye. Hi, I'm Emma, and I live in Portland, Maine. Here are the staff credits. Radio Lab was created by Jad Abumrad and is edited by Soren Wheeler. Lulu Miller and Latif Nasser are our co-hosts. Dylan Keefe is our director of sound design. Our staff includes Simon Adler, Jeremy Bloom, Becca Bressler, W. Harry Fortuna, David Gable, Maria Paz Gutierrez, Sindhu Nyana Sambandam, Matt Kilty, Annie McEwen, Alex Neeson, Valentina Powers, Sara Kari, Sarah Sandback, Ariane Wack, Pat Walters, and Molly Webster. Our fact checkers are Diane Kelly, Emily Krieger, and Natalie Middleton.